Hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Mark Raven, and we're joined today. Our guest is Ritu Ward. She's a healthcare executive with success in delivering quality, growth, and strategy while leading high-performing teams. Ritu, how are you? I'm good. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for inviting me to the podcast. Yeah, well, okay. I think we have a, a good conversation today, and it's uh, it's good to talk to you. We're recording. We're recording this. You know, let the listeners and viewers know that. Um, did, did we did we cross paths before uh, Kinexus Circles? Yes, we have. Uh, we did uh, actually. Yeah. Actually, I have followed you, Mark, since I've become a lean practitioner. So it's over ten years, not to date you or I. Um, and we crossed paths at Mercy Health, where we implemented Kinexus for um, securing their lean journey, is how I would put it. And that gives me great comfort in knowing that. So we've known each other there. And then you also helped me broadcast a series of one podcast, really, on leadership development. And we talked about what it means to be an authentic leader and in the healthcare system. So I'm glad we did that because I've had to leverage all of that now as I'm in sort of the gap situation of in between organizations in how do I rebuild myself? Mm -hmm. So this is one of my vulnerability podcasts to really show and talk about what it feels like. Yeah, well, and I appreciate you. Um, be willing to do that and, and, and talk about um, you know, rebuilding organizations, rebuilding ourselves as individuals during um, trying times. And I will post in the show notes, you mentioned the presentation you did, that's in the, uh, the, the Kinexus webinar series, mm -hmm. that presentation you did last, late last year? In November, yes. In November, yeah. I should look these things up instead of guessing <laughs> while we're recording, so I apologize for that. But um, Ritu, if, maybe first, if, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and your professional background in, in history for the listeners, you know, the types of things that you've done uh, as, as a Certainly. leader. Yeah. So I represent over 15 years of leadership expertise by trying and challenging myself to do better in quality assurance and developing the strength in any bench that I have ever worked with in terms of leadership. I hold a proven track record of driving profitability and creating success processes that lead to further development. I would say that no matter where I'm at in terms of the revenue cycle, strategy, customer service, and team building, I've always focused on people and using my lean methodology of leading with respect, understanding their workspace, which I might add is, is even more critical now than it has ever been before. And, and you've had those leadership roles in hospital laboratories and also more broadly, there's different labels in different organizations, but basically um, exactly. performance excellence, process improvement type roles, right? So yes, I've worked in large healthcare systems like Atrium Health and most recently with Mercy Health. I would say I have worked in complex healthcare systems where collaboration between information technology, quality leaders, physicians, nursing, and laboratory have been the core competency. And I've leveraged CEXOs in terms of building relationships, proving to them that building efficient processes ultimately delivers best outcomes for the patient. So I'm keeping patients in mind. The complexity has been uh, a challenge because everybody comes from a different perspectives. And I have learned to listen more than to be able to articulate what I'm there for. And I've enjoyed those experiences. Um, yeah, I've spent um, a good amount of time in hospital laboratories and, you know, working with medical technologists. And, you know, I, 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 I appreciate your emphasis on um, developing people. You know, that's something that, that Toyota um, really puts in, in the front and center when it comes to the Toyota production system. You know, I, I would propose a lean organization does the same. But what I was going to ask about, you know, the laboratory setting maybe in particular and, and developing people what, what, what are, you know, like sometimes people are hesitant to step up from the laboratory bench 
into leadership roles? What, what are some of your thoughts around, you know, coaching people um, to, to, to maybe take a risk to step up to becoming a leader? So I have a short story about that. In my early development in the career, I used to be on the bench as obvious and had all these decisions come down the pipeline. And my whole thing was what Yahoo decided this. And then I became one of those Yahoo because I wanted to have a seat at the table. At that point, I was naive. I thought I could tell the world what works best, closest to the process. I think I was on the right track, but didn't really understand it. In the laboratory field, we're all introverts. We are a black and white. We are about quality. We produce 70% of anybody's medical record. We provide the clues to the puzzle. So the challenge becomes, why should I do something different? You as a leader, traditional leader in the lab have told me, this is the procedure I have to follow. This is the process I have to do and I get proven results. I get a result out. The challenge I find is to join and connect that specimen and speak of it as a real patient. And that grabs, you know, in lean again, is grabbing the heart, giving them the respect. My biggest challenge has been giving them a platform to speak. Most people have not been asked to speak and share their success or their failure, or simply say the statement, this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started, you know, so I would walk in their shoes using the old methodologies of proven ones, Ono Circle. Or actually my favorite question is, um, what's not working for you today? Mm -hmm. You get a plethora of good things to work on. And then of course, as you know, you have to support them and create a culture that is not negative, yeah. that is yeah. open, right? Yeah. yeah. And I, I agree with you. I think it's important for leaders to really go out and try to draw out of frontline employees what they're thinking. Um, you know, the flip side to that, unfortunately, is when leaders sometimes develop what, what might be a bit of a bad habit of, you know, blaming employees for not speaking up. You should have spoken up, but that's easier said than done when um, maybe, you know, the culture in the past hasn't rewarded speaking up. Right. I mean, you, do, do you, can you, can you share a little bit more about, you know, really kind of, you know, doing that on an ongoing basis or as you moved up through the ranks of becoming, you know, vice president of laboratory ser services, how do you encourage the directors or managers or supervisors under you to help create that environment? Well, the first beginning is show by example. So people learn differently. Some will learn by giving, uh, by being present. Some learn by a session of two hours first before you kind of deploy it. The biggest thing I found is to say, I will help you. I will be right there and failure is okay because frontline staff without the correct leaders managing them in their habits and creating a standard work. That's the hardest thing is the discipline of it. So I have done so by uh, my last team at Mercy we went on a strategy session. You know, everybody typically new leader does that. And they didn't know what to expect. And they thought I was out of my mind when I said, I just want to hear, what do you want to do? Right. And that was so liberating for them. Like, you want to know what we think would work? They forget about the people. It's what the process, what do you want? We know what the goals are. What do you want to do? And that was a very exciting conversation. Yeah. What, what, what do you want? What do you need? Um, you know, I think taking care of staff is important, but when they're doing that on behalf of patients, that's even more powerful. Like, you know, you, you're, you're reminding me of a, a lab director I worked with who, who recognized, um, you know, for the medical technologists who are in the lab, typically down in the basement, right? <laughs> Somewhat right. Hidden yes, away. In the dark. Down <laughs> in the dark. Um, to, to view the work as a tube of blood or a plate or a specimen, this lab director actually went and got um, from the hospital 
marketing communications department. They had photos, images, maybe there were stock photos or there were clearly they were taken with permission at some point, staged photos. And he had them framed and put up around the lab as a very, um, you know, I, 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 not very, so it didn't have to be subtle, but not, not so very subtle reminder um, that this is connected to, to people and, and their health and their care. And yeah, people know that, but I, I think it was important and helpful to really, you know, keep that in front of people. Because otherwise I think the risk is that we get so busy, then mm -hmm. you start thinking um, tasks, results, work, and, and, and maybe lose sense of that, that, that connection to purpose. Exactly. And what I also found as a laboratorian, as you asked earlier, you know, how did you um, elevate, so to speak, the leaders in the lab to be more outgoing is um, creating a collaboration between pharmacies. That was easy one because it's silent, right? You have the results, you have the medications, let's help them. And also with nursing in the emergency room, that is where I think the lab saw the patient because as they were working with the nurses and as they were working with them, they realized, oh, wow, you know, there, there is a patient behind this. Yeah. yeah. But if we weren't there, we knew what the patient was about. We were there to help nursing understand that labeling, collection of the specimen, all the pre-analytical stuff is key to getting you the right result at the right time at the right place. Mm -hmm. I always imagine a healthcare environment where there is everything happening at the right time, at the right place, with a hundred percent quality results. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. takes a village to create that. Yeah. And and I like the way you talk about not just developing people, but elevating leaders. You know, leaders are, are people too, but if uh, leaders are not yet comfortable in doing what they need to do to really engage and develop people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there, there's an important chain there of, of coaching the leaders so they can coach their employees, right? So I think that was challenged a lot with the recent COVID pandemic. So um, at Mercy, the team there basically did not panic because our supply chain is so limited. And they didn't panic at all. They just said, we're just going to have to sit back and think about what can we do creatively? And one of the examples was, if the swabs are not available, can we make our own? Can we print our own? You know, that was an innovative idea. And it came from leaders that just sat around the table and said, how can we do this better? And, and you're talking about uh, 3D printing? Yes. Swabs? Really? Wow. Yes. Is that, I mean, yeah, um, you, you lived through this. I only read about... Yeah, how, how something, you know, we talk about um, test capacity and test availability for COVID-19, something as relatively simple and a relatively inexpensive as a swab was at times the bottleneck in that whole testing process, right? And it continues to be so. Our supply chain, if one thing in retrospect we learned from this pandemic is the healthcare supply chain is at best 30 to 45 days inventory. Now imagine that for a minute and say, we're talking about consumable supplies. We're talking about keeping healthcare workers safe. So our emphasis, at least my leadership's emphasis was, how do we keep our coworkers that provide the care safe? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for all, all the known reasons, all our energy was put in being creative we cashed in all our relationships with the vendors. And in the end, the government um, allocated resources because that's the only way they could provide the right amount for the locations that were the hotspots. And I would think that in the, during those times, everything got challenged. Your personal compass, your moral beliefs, you had to decide and ration test. Lab's never done that. You know, how is your test more important than the one that patient that's staying at home? Wow. You have to think about all those things. And that, those, and that, well, I'm sorry, but th those decisions were being made in the lab. If there were a hundred or I'm just making up numbers, a hundred orders that came in and you only had the capacity to do 60 today. Yes. 
Wow. So the way we did that, again, is leveraging our relationships with the physician leaders, cooperating with them and saying, I'm not going to I'm not going to be put in this position. I'd like you to establish the guardrail Mm. because it became more critical when we wanted to bring healthcare back alive or elected. How is your elective procedure? Is should I use my test to do your test or should I use my test to do a test of a person in the emergency room? Only a physician can tell me that. Yeah. We have to put guardrails around it. Right? Going back to lean principles is what is our guiding principle? What can we agree with? What do we live on? And how do we not put our frontline staff in a day-to-day battle? And, and you know, to- Hearing what you're saying there, some of those core lean principles come through loud and clear in no particular order. Uh, Customer focus, focusing on your making safety a precondition and focusing on the needs of staff, engaging and developing people. Um, So I want to maybe take a detour back before we come back and talk about maybe how this was helpful during the COVID crisis. If if I have one question that... um, I consistently ask all of my guests it kind of goes back to, you know, your own lean origin story, if you will. Um, how, how did you first, did you remember how, how and when you first got introduced to lean? Being in a lab environment was probably a while ago relative to other parts of healthcare, right? Well, I'm a victim of Six Sigma. <laughs> so that's where it started for me. Uh, well, so tell us about that. Why, why, why do you say it that way? <laughs> Because uh, to me, I was very inquisitive about equality systems as a whole. And my journey into methodology, so to speak, started with becoming a Six Sigma black belt uh, with an organization called Quest Diagnostics now. Mm -hmm. And actually, at that time, the CEO had made it a requirement that in order to become a leader of the future, you would have taken one year out of process and learned Six Sigma, become a black belt and then repatriate back. Mm-hmm. Times change. My lean introduction and journey started with Carolina's healthcare system, where I was fortunate enough to meet a lot of lean senseis, and that organization invested in a department of process excellence. And Michael Johnston was my key coach. He, um, I again stepped out of process of leadership of the laboratory as a vice president and landed into a lean quality improvement journey. And I wanted to learn more about it. And I learned one thing, you never stop learning. If there's anything that has made me a better human being and a better leader is because I have constantly a path that I must improve on myself. And my team forces me to do that. Matter of fact, I made a joke, somebody, Right after leaving Mercy, I was taking one of those online tests and I didn't score five out of five being the highest. I was like a 4.8. So I sent a note back to my leadership team, the ones that I coached. And I said, you know, very disappointed because you didn't challenge me enough. If you had, there's no way I could have not aced this exam. They thought it was kind of funny because they were all about, well, you know, how could you not? We view you. No, there's a gap. I, I'm always improving. And I think you have to be challenged to push forward. And that's where I find myself today is how do I, in this gap situation before my next opportunity, how do I improve myself? And what would I do differently? Yeah. What would I do differently? So the, those cycles of reflection are really important. I mean, again, I, th- I think that demonstrates, um, like, you know, to me that, that that's fundamental lean thinking. That's, um, you know, viewing um, ourselves and our work as a never ending experiment that can always be improved, right? The element of continuous improvement requires, you know, looking at um, gaps between whether it's our own performance or the organization, what we expected to happen and what actually happened. Well, I have to say, you've hit upon one of my uh, Achilles heel, so to speak. Reflections are not easy for me. 
Um, I would think they would be by now since I've been journaling for over five years. If Michael hears this, he'll be glad to know I'm continuing that process. Um, but in my journaling, what I have found is maturity of self. And on my bad days, which there are, I'm able to reflect back at least on a small success story and say, wow, that was fun. And it's never about me. It's always been seeing the bright, shiny eyelids of somebody that just got it. Like, oh, wow, you've helped me think this through. And that is neat. And not only that, I've moved away from saying the five whys are killing me <laughs> to I think I could get down to the root cause. And most people that know me now is like, wow, get ready for five whys. Here they come. <laughs> And I do that with my own reflection. Like, and it's mostly about feelings now. Why do I feel angry? But why do I feel peaceful? Mm -hmm. And why do I find that I can go back out and do that again? Mm -hmm. and, and that's where I'm at in my journey right now. How, how can I not necessarily tool myself? I've got that. Um, failures, I've got that. Successes, I've got that. Yeah. what's the next step how do you find and become part of something bigger than yourself mm -hmm. so i want to um maybe come back to but there's a lot to think about from what uh from what you said there um try to pause my own reflection and uh not let that derail the uh the interview oh no i'd love to hear it <laughs> um well no i mean so um yeah, I mean, I think reflections, that, that, that's an interesting point around why am I reacting a certain way to a certain situation? So um, you, you, you mentioned earlier being vulnerable and maybe I'll, I'll do the same if you forgive the uh, diversion. But, um, you know, I think one, one thing I've, str I've struggled with during the pandemic is maybe it's just, you know, I, I think like as an engineer and just the way I'm wired, um, I'm... I'm easily dissatisfied with the status quo, which can be a strength. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, trying to help drive change requires not being satisfied with how things are today. Um, but then, you know, I think during the pandemic, um, you know, I find myself sometimes getting more irritated than I should with like small, I'm not being very resilient. I think if I'm using that word correctly, like small, relatively unimportant hassles in my daily life, just kind mm -hmm. of, not flying off the handle, but like this is kind of just low grade irritation that doesn't seem healthy or sometimes is not pleasant to be around. <laughs> and, you know, so I'm trying to step back and you know, what your question of, of, of kind of prompting like, well, why, why am I being so irritated by something relatively small? Relatively speaking, life is, is good. I have, uh, you know, so anyway, I, 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 I appreciate that. You know, I'll, I'll think about this more after the episode, but um, I don't know. You know, throw it back to you. If there are any other, any other thoughts around what we try to learn from trying to look inward at times and and think, well, why am I reacting this way? How can you get better at that? Well, okay. so I have. I'm sure you do too. I have an incredible spouse. Yeah, he has Thank been you. my mentor for a very long time, as long as I can remember, probably. Uh, but he's also my best friend. And what I, when I say that, what I mean is we all have those individuals in our lives that have never seen me break down. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is hard. It is hard for me to go tell him, this is how I feel. I have talked to so many colleagues that are in the same boat as I am. And I'm sorry if I'm being irritated because you dropped a drop of water on my kitchen floor mm -hmm. so you kind of I understand there's a lot of forces around us and for me in the last six weeks has been more about it's irritating to put a mask on my face mm -hmm. as a healthcare worker I know it's necessary right but if I can look beyond that what am I learning through it is what I'm challenging myself what am I learning about myself? And I tell you, Mark, I'm sure you will too. There are a lot of things I'm learning about myself that I probably don't like. 
and I either have to resolve to like them mm. or understand that I'm under stress and I need to take a breather. The one thing I'm doing more of is creating the space to be myself, mm. whatever that evolves to be. I have to dedicate time to say, I am not going to look at my device. I am not going to worry about whether I'm going to have a roof above my head or my finances or my family. I'm just going to think about what Ritu is and what is she feeling? And you know what? The saddest part is sometimes the answer is there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. So then I rely on the old phrase, you know, I'm going to pray about the things that I cannot change. And I'm going to worry about the things that I can influence. And that bucket is very small. <laughs> and then I just kind of move on and listen to the noises around me of nature. Yeah. yeah. And in this day and age, there's plenty to worry about that is out of our control. And, and I think that's, that's one of the things that is, you know, I put in the category of unhealthy inputs um, to my, to my brain and my mood of uh, <laughs> like trying to turn off the news. Like I, I want to know what's going on in the world, but sometimes frankly, I mean, it, it becomes overwhelming. It's outside of my own sphere of influence, maybe other right. than going to the ballot box when that time comes. But yeah, on a daily basis, there, there's a lot to worry about that. I, I, I yeah, um, try to you know, put it out of mind, maybe in an appropriate, in an appropriate way, um, but not let it get to be too much. But I think the human side of it, I am also amazed as to how many individuals like yourself step up to support us as individuals that are leaders and find themselves in a different world right now. Um, there is some joy in that in terms of connecting and, in, and being able to share your vulnerabilities, yeah. developing some humility mm -hmm. and saying, uh, I don't want to hear it's going to be okay. because that's a given. It's going to be all right. What I want to hear about is what are you feeling? What are you thinking? Um, and out of that, you know, creating a safe space to just unload for a few minutes and just then keep going. You know, Mercy was a very, um, health organization nonprofit that really relied on its mission principles of being a faith based organization. And we all were under the trainings of what they call leadership development, but really making yourself strong in the faith, not in Christianity, but just in general, being a, developing your human compass. And one of the leaders there always used to tell me, he says, you know, it's okay to be angry with two. And I would look at him very strangely and say, no, it's not. My face can't show that. I can't lash out. He says, no, it's okay. It really is. Deal with that. But don't stay there too long, my dear, and then you'll just move on. <laughs> it's comforting. It, there was so much said in that one statement, I believe. Yeah. I try to remember that. Yeah. For my, yeah. For my, yeah. I mean, it's a good reminder. Of, yeah. It's it, it's a, like how, yeah. It's okay, but don't stay there too long. Right. And my only question, knowing my five whys, was how long is too long? <laughs> <laughs> um. So one, one other thing, so, you know, I mean, you know, in the spirit of reflection and, and what you've learned, um, you know, during, during this crisis, uh, you know, when you were there in that leadership role, um, you know, how did your leadership style or how did your leadership style change given supply chain challenges, uncertainties, fears, um, PPE concerns, there was so much I'm sure that was flying at you all at once as a leader. You know, I became more collaborative, collaborative than I would have ever thought I would have become. I started to um, think about all the possibilities out of the box and knew that I couldn't just do that from behind my desk. I had the people input. For once in my life, I actually had a plan of things that I had to do. I had to have the best supply chain that I possibly could. I had to think out of the box. I had to get physician input. I had to get nursing input. And more importantly, I had to build a business case to get more financial resources to invest in it. Nobody had millions of dollars lying around for this kind of story to evolve. 
And I found one thing that I found the most comforting was looking at it from the lens of the patient. Mm -hmm. While all these things had to happen, I would always stop a conversation by saying, how is it that what we're talking about going to help the patient? If you could answer me that, we would be great, right? And then I learned how to ask for timelines, hold me accountable so that I don't come at you every day asking for the same thing. The other thing that changed in me was I used to think that babysitting my team was my job. And babysitting, I mean by preventing them from falling or preventing, looking through every possibility. And then I discovered that if I asked them what was important to them, what would make them feel better today, it was different. All they want, what they asked for is talk to us. Mm -hmm. Remember how we do managing daily improvement? Can we just not talk about improving the process, but just talk about our people emotions? What are we going? Mm -hmm. They had fears. Yeah. And, there, and it, all they wanted to hear was, I fear the same thing. Now, this is what I'm thinking on how to approach it or how we're thinking as an organization. What do you think? Again, you know, scheduling never became an issue because they jumped in and said, we realize we're going to have to work additional hours, et cetera, et cetera. This is what we can do. This is what I want to do. What if we changed this to doing only two times a day versus five times? a day? You know, um, so my leadership style changed and I created more empathy bank. And that empathy led to more trust. Mm -hmm. And um, that is my biggest learning that I would take to my next mm -hmm. adventure and say that through my gap time, this is what mm -hmm. I've learned. And it's important. So what I hear you saying is that, you know, during, during a time that was really busy, uh, the need to focus on the work, the test results, the volume, the problem solving, that those human connections and those relationships are a really important foundation, right? How, how can people focus on the work if they're not feeling heard or acknowledged or respected as individuals with fears and a desire to help, but fears and anxieties, right? Yeah. And you know what, Mark? It was amazing. It wasn't all about money. It wasn't about how I'm going to eat. They too were focused on how do we approach this body of work in front of us and how do we get it done to the point of um, that coworker is pregnant right now. We can't ask her to work eight hours, but I can pick up a couple of hours there. My fear was, the biggest fear I had is running out of human capital. And by that, I mean skill sets. People need downtime. They had a lot. And then we all got sent home, right? And that was a very different type of leadership. What, what, what happened there? What do you mean? The leaders um, work from home, don't oh. report in, right? So I never felt so non-essential as I did then. Mm -hmm. uh, but Zoom connectivity and I would think that if I didn't have the relationship we wouldn't have bonded as well and been able to connect um, on the electronic platform so one of my favorite things and I still don't recall how I came up to it but it will be a long-lived story um, the day that I was notified in the afternoon that I no longer was needed as a reduction in force that morning was our typical leadership meeting with my six direct reports. And I simply sent an email saying, we're gonna do the Zoom, but bring your coloring pencils and something you wanna color. And we just colored. Mm -hmm. We talked and we colored. And they remember that forever because that created space 
with everything that was going on, we didn't talk about business. We didn't talk about people. We didn't, we just played. And I think that is the essence of creativity. You know, how we used to do, we built a tree house, come here and draw on the walls and do all of that. And all it was is create some downtime. Play together, but created some downtime for 30 minutes. And it was the one thing they remember the most. And, you know, that 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 play or that that human connection you know is important different levels one i guess just you know uh i mean i'm, I'm reminded you know i think of uh, one of my mentors um, pascal dennis who had been who had worked for toyota in uh ontario canada and you know pascal would talk about his time within the toyota work culture and he would always talk about continuous improvement and the need for creativity. And creativity is often sparked, he would use the phrase, a playful spirit of thinking like the work, you know, we, we, we can have this kind of dual nature of like doing incredibly serious work, whether that's building vehicles that are safe and building them in a safe way, or taking care of patients in a mm -hmm. way that's safe for everybody involved. We can have deadly serious work, but recognizing that the playful spirit is is good for the soul it's good for creativity i think you see this as much as you can generalize about cultures uh, when i've had the opportunity to go to japan you know yeah. japan is very you know work, work hard serious place but then you see you know um the the the, the anime and the, the the cartoon characters and um you, that, 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 you know, there, there's that interesting combination of seriousness and playful spirit. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you've seen connections like that in different organizations you've worked in or, or how that might be important. Well, so I've created those yeah. intentionally in right. any workspace that I have been with my team. Intentionally, because I find out so much about their desires of what they really want to be and what their passions are right i would have never known it that my, one of my leaders passion is photography that's good to know um another one had a passion for outdoors you couldn't get this guy to come inside for anything but the creativity that came out of that was they gave each other feedback of what they perceived the other person's strength to be which was completely different than my perception. And I found value in that because I'm always about growing people. So if their perception was that they're better in, I'm making this up in mathematics and I've never seen anything as a P other than a P and L out of them, I, I, I start to think about how can I use, utilize them more in the next project or situation where they can step it up because it's about building the confidence in whatever their skill set is. Because somebody did that for me. They found the ultimate statement to say to me is, Ritu, sometimes you have to say, you're good enough. You really are. And it's building that confidence and then let them explore and grow. So I create fun stuff intentionally. Yeah. I will yeah. take the team to a zoo because I love elephants. And we walk around the zoo. That's our retreat. Why not? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, but we also do some intentional work and there's learning and there's projecting and success stories. And I always try to keep everybody, um, uh, I'd like to have fun. So that's, yeah. that's my calling card. If we're going to work together, we'll have some fun. And, you know, I'll share a little bit. I mean, we talk about um, some of these conversations and, and, you know, taking care of in, in, you know, individuals' needs as people. Um, I, you know, I think back to, you know, mid-March when the world is changing and, you know, the, the, the Kinexus team was suddenly now not able to go to the offices in Austin mm -hmm. or the Dallas area. And, and I'll give, um, you know, 
the co-founders and, and, and leaders, you know, Greg Jacobson as CEO, Matt Flulis as COO, um, Jeff Roussel as, you know, not a co-founder, but kind of the third piece of the executive leadership team. And we would get on Zoom. And yes, there was still a lot of work to be done. There was a lot to figure out about what was going to be changing, how to continue supporting customers, whose circumstances were also changing. You know, there's just a, a lot going on. And they really emphasized in, in these Zoom calls in different ways, checking in. How are you doing? Not is your work on schedule? How are you doing? And really having a lot of conversations. Um, I, I, you know, I, I appreciated that because it would, you know, I, I, I think, that was the right investment in people and the team and, and the company. And it's not just a financial payoff investment, but I mean, like really investing in, in, in caring for people that, that is very much um, compatible with, with running, whether it's a, a nonprofit health system or a for-profit software company. So I wanna you know, give them a little recognition you know, we try to do some things that are fun, but like if people are not in a place for having fun, let's address that. Let's 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 check in on people individually and, and as a group. I think it was really important. I really appreciated their leadership style and their approach. And and as you know, things have kind of settled into a new normal for now. There's still, you know, there's a little bit more of emphasis of okay, let's do some things that are fun. Let's not be stuck at home working constantly. Yes, yeah, so, so how do you find that balance? Have you found it yet? How do I find that personally around like not being stuck at home? Yeah. No, I mean, um, I think what the leadership did at Connect oh, is awesome. Yeah. I would find very difficult to answer that question. So I'm asking from your perspective, was it easy to answer that question? And how do you find that balance? So, I mean, I think, you know, with all things, there, there are feedback loops. If, you know, you, you talked earlier about the importance of listening as a leader. Because um, I imagine the feedback loops, the feedback could come from any, either direction. Maybe the group says, okay, enough with this. We have work to do. I think it's great that you're concerned about us, but I'm concerned with not getting my work done. Like people might be in that space. And again, like not because they're, they're, it's not from a place of fear, but it's just from a desire to serve customers, right. <laughs> finding, you know, pride and joy in work, or it might come from the other direction. If as a leader, you're saying, like, okay, well, we've done, we've done the check-in. Now let's go, let's, let's go back to talking about tasks and schedules and part, like people might push back and say, okay, wait a minute. Whoa, not ready for that yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you, know, you got to kind of read the room, if you will, and and you know, Zoom maybe helps in terms of seeing body language. It's not as good as being there in person, but it's it's maybe it's better than just dialing into a conference call where people can sit there silently and you don't know if they're happy, distracted, stewing over something. Right. I agree. I think it was the same. It's it's a very different new world that we're going to be entering now because even um, you know there's no travel is limited, so job interviews and stuff are basically on Zoom. So you really have to work on bringing your best self and being in the right frame of mind. And speaking of vulnerability, you showcase where you work from, <laughs> right? Uh, I'm admiring your long space there and, you know, trying to figure out what folks does he have over there. Yeah. It's the same thing as inviting somebody to your home and saying, this is who I am. So maybe we'll show our true selves after all. Yeah, this, this, yeah. Room's, this room's a bit of a bowling alley. It's, sort of <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's very long. It gives you very big perception and depth. <laughs> and, and, and I do, I mean, I, I have, I mean, I have books that are not my books. In okay. The, in the room. Yeah, same here. <laughs> um, but if, so if you don't mind me asking, I mean, um, what, what, what are you hoping your next adventure 
might be. I'm curious about that, and then maybe talk a little bit about the process of getting there. But what, what what's an ideal state for you? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, my ideal state is to be useful in any aspect of healthcare delivery model uh, and delivering the best potential service to a patient. I'm very intrigued about the telemedicine component that's getting ready to evolve. Um, I know there are lots of virtual platforms that are still disconnected from each other. Um, from my personal experience with my husband using healthcare recently, all the way to a surgical procedure, it was pretty seamless and non-cumbersome. And I'd like to continue to work in that space in building relationships. I also know that getting a little bit specific in the lab world, a couple of healthcare systems are looking to consolidate the laboratory spaces, um, come up with better test menus that are more aligned with efficient processes. Um, and I think I can be a value there. So the challenge right now is colleagues that I would normally network with are in the same boat that I am, or I am saddened by the fact that organizations are not thinking about what type of leadership structure we need to put in place to address the upcoming needs in the next five years. Mm -hmm. that, that personally saddens me because I know the momentum healthcare organizations had. The plus side of that is that they are all um, coming from a state of fear or had already developed processes for telehealth and efficient ones that they need to act on now. They really do versus we'll get to it when we get to it. And my last fear is I wouldn't want anybody to say, I want to go back to where we were. And all these cliche terms, you know, reinvent yourself, the new norm. How about just saying, how can we improve what we have and make it better? And right now is the right opportunity to do that. And then um, I'm you know, curious if you could elaborate a little bit on the process. You mentioned having to do a lot of Zoom. Um, what, mm -hmm. what, what, what else seems to be different right now, I wonder? Well, searching for a job right now is very different. <laughs> Um, you know, I remember when we used to have to just do, uh, maybe go on LinkedIn and look at job boards and things like that. Right now, as an applicant, there's a plethora of information coming at you. Um, there's a different way of interviewing. We just consider that Zoom. And I am wow. not a great Facebook or Twitter. <laughs> and um, so I'm entering into a new world and learning a whole new language. And I think I'm going to rely on my nieces and nephews to tell me that. Yeah. Uh, but that's what I'm being encouraged to do is to have a digital platform that works for you mm -hmm. because information is key, but availability is even more key. So I'm finding that and navigating that to be challenging for me. Yeah. And I consider myself pretty savvy. So uh, there's a lot I don't know. And my biggest strength is to remain curious and learn from webinars. I've learned from Kinex's webinars, learn from the other organizations I belong to, like American College of Healthcare Executives, American Society of Clinical Pathologists. I would say that in a week's time frame, I'm spending at least 15 working hours either teaching myself or learning online. Um, because I, I don't want to be left behind. I want to be relevant. If there's one advice I can give anybody in life is remain relevant in whatever your passion is yeah. and find well, ways to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I appreciate, you know, you talking about wanting um, to learn. You've got a lot to share and I mean, just to explore for a minute, maybe, you know, LinkedIn provides opportunities for, for sharing reflections, mm -hmm. thoughts, knowledge, experiences, whether that's through, you know, short updates or through longer articles, right. uploading video. I mean, you know, there, there's all sorts of possibilities. 
of how to share on LinkedIn. Um, because you know, I think professionally that that might be the most productive um, place to be. Like, you know, I'm, I've been on Twitter for a long time. I use it less and less. You know, I can say only. Oh, okay. <laughs> Twitter is the place to go when you want to be angry about something. <laughs> Who else okay. is angry about what? And I've been guilty. You know, I'm angry about airline. Or, you know, uh, something. But um, you know, and LinkedIn sometimes, unfortunately, devolves into that it's a reflection of the times but i think you know linkedin is the more professional focused platform in terms of networking and sharing um so maybe there's oh, there's, there's things yeah. to do there well you've at least taught me one thing today that is more than one thing but i don't want to be on twitter then well, because i don't want <laughs> i don't want to be in the plethora of opinions <laughs> I mean, I'm, you know, not, not trying to scare you off from that altogether, but really maybe, you know, it's just thinking of, you know, you'd mentioned Facebook and Twitter. And I think that like, yeah. you know, Facebook is a, a personal place to be. Uh, Twitter can be both LinkedIn. Yeah. It has become more of a social network and not just a place to list an online resume. Exactly. And, and there's an art to using it too. So luckily they teach you. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> And, and so I mean, have you found resources when you talk about learning and, and they teach you re research? Because I can always sh sharpen the saw, if you will. Have you found resources that might be useful to others, of, of, you know, kind of navigating LinkedIn and or navigating a job search if someone else is in that situation? So the two things I found useful is, of course, LinkedIn has online self-learning courses that you can take to learn the platform. It also provides you with examples of how you can use hashtags to your advantage, mm -hmm. which I find important. The other thing I've recently done is joined the LinkedIn Premier Membership because it allows me to see very quickly who within my network is at that organization I'm interested in. And following the top 50 organizations or so that you want, I found that helpful. I've also, on the other side of it, building capabilities um, Microsoft Office 365 offers a lot of learnings in terms of sharpening your pencil in presentation skills, as well as Excel skills, which become very important in data management. And that's where my headspace is at. There's a lot of big data coming at us. How do we use that in the healthcare field? And recently, Google has also launched that it will be teaching and providing certificates with online learning. Hmm. And um, so, you know, majority of this stuff that I'm just talking about is free. Yeah. The investment is your time. So I would encourage people, it may not be that you sit through the whole thing, but at least invest in it, uh, your time in it. That's all I've got right now yeah. is plenty yeah. of time. Um, you know, because of the time zone adjustment and everything, it works. Well, and uh, you know, I want to um, as we wrap up here. Thank you, Ritu, for for sharing reflections and lessons and, and leadership tips. There's a lot um, to think about. Um, people want to find you; they can do so on LinkedIn. It looks like you're Absolutely. well. It's just LinkedIn.com/in/Ritu Ward. R-I-T-U Ward. Um, so I imagine people might want to connect with you there. Um, yeah. If you want to share an email address or, it's, or just yes, your, your LinkedIn. LinkedIn is fine. And my email is R-I-T-U-S-1 at live.com. And it's also on my profile. Okay. So I encourage individuals to uh, let's just talk. Yeah. See what you've learned and um, go from there. Yeah. Well, I'm sure the 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 from there, the, the, the where you go from here will uh, lead to something um, interesting and fulfilling for you. So please keep, keep me posted on um, how that's coming. Certainly wish you the best. Always. Of that too. Thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here again. Our guest has been uh, Ritu Ward. She's a healthcare executive with um, great track record in um, you know, laboratory and, and beyond. And, and there's a, a new opportunity, I'm sure, ahead uh, for her in uh, the future. And, and again, I would encourage everyone to uh, go to the, uh, the show notes, the podcast page. You can find it in 
the podcast description or where else you're gonna have this. This is also on YouTube. You can look in the notes. Um, you can find the link to that webinar that uh, Ritu presented last November for Kinexus on, uh, on leadership. Um, a lot of great information there. So again, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to share and be here with us today. Take care, Mark. You too.